To make it appeal to the emperor's devotedness to the French people was to dictate his decision. Fouché knew it well. The emperor dictated the act of abdication with the rapidity of determination, which was characteristic of his peculiar organization in the field of battle. An hour afterwards, France learned from the imperial commissioners sent to the legislative chambers that Napoleon had just placed his crown in the hands of the representatives of the nation. He said in a tone of deep conviction that the experience of his life had taught him that in the times of a national crisis, safety can only be hoped for from the rule of a government which has all the necessary means of force and terror at command. Comparing the conduct of Carnot on this occasion with his behavior as a member of the Committee of Government, I should say that now, as a fructidor, that honorable man was the dupe of royalist intrigues, active abdication, Frenchmen in commencing war for the maintenance of national independence. I relied on the union of all efforts, of all wills, on the cooperation of all national authorities. I had reason to hope for success, and I disregarded all the declarations of the powers against me. Circumstances appear to me changed. I offer myself as a sacrifice to the hatred of the enemies of France. May they prove sincere in their declarations and have really directed them against my power alone. My political life is terminated, and I proclaim my son under the title of Napoleon II, Emperor of the French. Present ministers will form the Council of the Provisional Government. The interest which I take in my son induces me to invite the chambers to form a regency without delay by a specific law. Let all unite for the public safety in order to remain an independent nation. Signed, Napoleon. The two chambers receive the abdication as the last act of homage offered to his country. This feeling prompted them to send a deputation to thank the great man to whom they were about no longer to give the name of emperor for the sacrifice which he had just made to France. But this sacrifice was made on condition that the king of Rome should be proclaimed emperor of the French. This proclamation, however, which seemed naturally to flow from the act of abdication itself, was obstructed by great difficulties. And the abdication being accepted, the combat was then commenced respecting the question of succession, as if this succession were not a necessary consequence of the previous event. The chamber was composed of four very distinct parties, Bonapartists, Royalists, Orleanists, and Republicans. The Bonapartists proved successful, and after the delivery several speeches, among which those of Beranger, Manuel, and Boulay de la Muerta are most worthy of notice. Napoleon II was proclaimed Emperor of the French. Other titles, such as those of King of Italy, Protector of the Germanic Confederation, ETC, had disappeared, but that which remained would alone have been sufficient to console the young King of Rome for the loss of the rest. Had this title been maintained, This proclamation of the King of Rome as Emperor of the French was, however, a delusion created by the treachery of Fouché. The confidence of the people was a misfortune, Hmm. for they had contemplated Louis XVIII, brought back to Paris by the ambassadors of the Chamber of Deputies. It would have led to a dreadful reaction and made the Palais Bourbon a scene of blood and the act of abdication would have been torn to pieces in the struggle. Some believed, others pretended to believe, and in spite of a vigorous resistance on the part of a few peers, the Duke of Otranto, General Count Grenier, General Carnot, the Duke of Vicenza, and Baron Quinet were appointed as provisional government and invested with supreme power during the interregnum. The word regency as it appears, had already been traitorously erased. Cambiceres, the high chancellor of the Duke Bassano, refused to retain their portfolios as Minister of Justice and Secretary of State, and their places were immediately filled up by the appointment of Boulay de la Muerta and Britier, who were members of the Council of State. 
all the other ministers continue to discharge the functions of their several offices till the reentry of Louis the Eighteenth into Paris. The Committee of Government was presided over by the Duke of Otranto, and all its decrees were issued in the name of the French people. At the same time, the provisional government was constituted. Commissioners chosen from the members of the two chambers were accredited to the foreign sovereigns to solicit the recognition of Napoleon II as Emperor of the French. The ex-emperor declared that if his son was recognized as his successor, his political life would come to an end with the last act of the drama and that he would retire as a private individual to the United States of America. This overture, as may well be supposed, was received with transport, and the greatest eagerness was manifested to get rid of a giant insufficiently chained by his defeat, every one of whose movements still made the whole of Europe tremble to this day. This overture, as may well be supposed, was received with transport. And the greatest eagerness was manifested. And I leave it to avenging history, whose sole mission it is the task of enumerating the intrigues and the defections of those days so full of disgrace to the French chambers. I am only anxious to remember and record the generous efforts of Jouet, Lebedoyer, and Regnon de Saint Jean d'Angely to recall to the minds of the peers and deputies the solemnity of their oaths, and shall confine myself to stating a fact known to few that the emperor submitted to the discussion of a privy council. The question, whether the hesitation of the chambers to proclaim Napoleon II and the treachery and falsehood which sent ambassadors to the headquarters of the allies, whether in short the loudly expressed feelings of devoted attachment to his person did not make it his duty to resume the care of saving his country from the yoke of foreigners or from a counter-revolution and to place himself at the head of the army, denouncing to the people the treachery of some and appealing to their indignation to conquer the common enemy. It was in this council that Prince Lucien revealed his ambition. After having fully explained the relations which for 15 years he had continued to maintain with the Republicans, his recent communications with them, their numbers, their hopes, and his profound conviction that the national crisis would be terrible and irresistible, if the emperor would lay down the crown and suffer him, Lucy Bonaparte, to invest himself with the dictatorial power by the instrumentality of the people of the Faubourgs, he would venture to push the illusions of this constant hope, which he brought to light this occasion so far as to say to the emperor. No one else says this. France has no longer any faith in the magic of the empire. It is eager for liberty, even with its abuses, and prefers the charter of all the greatness of your reign. With me, she will make the republic because she will believe in it. I will confer upon you the chief command of the army, and by the assistance of your sword, I will save the revolution. The emperor listened to these strange words without betraying his impressions by the slightest indications. It was the same Lucian who five years before pretended not to covet power, who now, as a future dictator, offered to his brother the command of the troops of his republic. He merely turned to Carnot and requested him to reply in his stead. I accept, said Carnot, that duty which your majesty imposes upon me, of stating my views, respecting the singular proposition which we have just heard. There is no man who is better entitled than myself to call himself the representative of the true republicans. I have had great experience of them, and I declare that there is none of them who would wish to exchange the dictatorship of your genius for that of the president of the Council of 500. The chambers are acting under the influence of an unexampled disaster. They are blinded by the cannon of Waterloo and betray their duty without knowing it. You alone can save us from the knout of the Allies, trust to the people. The abuses of its power will be only a just vengeance. Blue Shirt and Wellington will pause at its sight as the army of the Duke of Brunswick was stopped 
at the Place de Champagne when the people of Paris roast en masse and the revolution will be safe. If, on the contrary, you abdicate, Louis XVIII will re-enter Paris and the counter-revolution will be accomplished.